So my focus is going to be the 1950s to the 70s, but you can't really jump straight in there. You need to give a bit of the background beforehand. Um, and so that's where I'm starting here with this slide uh, from the 19th century. Now, the serifan uh, was the dress worn by peasant girls and women in the central and northern part of Russia up until sort of into the 20th century. Russian women from the upper and middle classes stopped wearing this traditional Russian costume around the 18th century, uh, and it became associated with peasant clothing um, and the sort of romanticization of that way of life that happened as industrialization grew. Now, even pre Revolution, 1917, there was an interest in folk dress, especially in avant-garde circles. Um, in 1913, you have the uh, first production of the Rite of Spring, with Ballet Russe performance. Uh, now, this really painted a picture of the mythical past of Russia, uh, and its subtitle was Pictures of Pagan Russia in Two Parts. So if any of you are familiar with the costumes from that, you'll know that there was sort of ideas of sort of folklore were very much coming into play in the costume. Um. Uh, so this is Queen Marie of Romania. Not quite Russia, I'm aware of that. Um, Queen Marie became known for setting trends for folk dress and for so-called peasant costume. She was the granddaughter of Queen Victoria and she married the Crown Prince of Romania and she often wore local dress to encourage her own sort of popularity in her new country. Now, she's very different to other contemporary leaders. Um, Elizabeth, the, Elizabeth, Edward VII, who was king, obviously the Edwardian king uh, in England, uh, his wife, Queen Alexandra of Denmark, was also known for setting trends, uh, but of a very different kind. Uh, it was much more in line with the sort of corseted Edwardian styles that we're familiar with. Queen Marie looked very different to other European rulers. After the 1907 Romanian peasants' revolt, uh, Marie particularly took to dressing quite often in folk costume, both at home and in public, and she actually initiated a fashion trend among upper-class young women. So when people tell you that street style originated in the sort of post-war era in the 1950s with the teddy boys and that kind of thing, don't believe them. People were, you know, the sort of aristocracy have been taking up, taking up versions of clothing of sort of lower classes for centuries. So these styles had a big impact in the teens and 20s um, on Western fashion with designers such as Poiret, who was working in Paris. Now, Romania at this time wasn't yet a communist country. Obviously, it had a uh, monarchy. Um, but it later became one of the Warsaw Pact countries that linked the communist states in Central and Eastern Europe. And it shows that the interest in folk motifs were really strong at this period in fashion. Now, Marie's clothes were based on peasant styles, but they were, of course, made of much finer fabric. And the embroidery wasn't from any particular region. It was this sort of conflation of different ideas, different techniques, um, which sort of added to the whole romanticization of peasant life that was happening at this time. So this is what... Um, this is how that sort of folk dress was translated into Bolshevik clothing in the 1920s. This is folkloric elements um, on very Western style dresses. Now at this period, um, Western dress was taking on a lot of global motifs. Um, after the discovery of um, Tutankhamun's tomb, there were huge trends for Egyptomania. Uh, and Poiret was also taking, taking inspiration from the Middle East, from Japan, and from Russia. So there was a lot of Orientalism happening in Western design at this time. Uh, on the left here is the designer Lamanova, who was the former owner of an elite fashion house pre-revolution. Now, to renegotiate her tenuous position under the Bolsheviks, she relied heavily um, on traditional embroidery motifs. This dress actually won a grand prize at an international exhibition of decorative arts in Paris in 1925, which a lot of people kind of cite as the very beginning of Art Deco. Now, it won a prize as an ethnic Russian dress, but it actually fuses Western fashion with, traditional, with a traditional Russian aesthetic. It was known as artistic dress, and so in that respect, it was different to the constructivists who were also operating at this time. Um, on the right, 
there is a journal which translates as Art of Dressing, which started in 1928. And the editorial for the first issue lays out some of the tensions around clothing that were being negotiated at this time. It said, some fear that clothing will become elegant or coquettish, and they consider it a great offence. For them, it is a philistine, or even worse, a bourgeois act. However, a certain amount of elegance and coquetry is by no means unsuited to the proletariat. So in contrast to artistic, uh, ethnically inspired dress, you have constructivist ideas. The constructivists avoided ethnic motifs. They thought it was too aligned with history, with tradition, with the past. They were very forward-looking. They were all about functionality and utility and practicality. Many Bolsheviks wanted a totally new type of clothing in the 1920s, and this idea of utopian dress began to circulate, which, was, which involved a complete rejection of the past, and it was only forward-looking. However, tradition wasn't entirely lost. If you have a look at the poster on the left, you can see that these women are wearing a geometric version of the sarafan, of the sort of pinafore traditional dress that you saw initially in the 19th century images. Uh, and also in these women on the left, you can see that the scarf, when it was tied below the chin, it signified a peasant woman. But when the scarf was tied at the back of the head, it represented workers. And you can clearly see that in both of these images going on here. Fashion magazines that had been published pre-revolution were completely abolished as they didn't fit with the socialist order. The first woman's magazine to be published came about in 1923, and it was called Rabotnitsa, excuse my pronunciation if it's completely wrong, uh, which translates as working woman. And it didn't include fashion at first. It took a while before fashion was taken up by the socialist press. The utopian dress of the 1920s opposed fashion as a commercialised and gendered practice, but it supported avant-garde artistic dress project, projects, and it wanted to fuse traditional crafts with high technology. Constructivist dress ideas were really promoted by designers like Popova and Stepanova, who were really influenced by cubism, by geometry, and by the idea of flatness. They were also influenced by earlier Italian futurist designs um, of utilitarian dress as well. Now, I recommend looking up um, Popova and Stepanova, as their designs are amazing. Um, it's not quite the focus of my talk, but um, that can be your homework. So functionality of clothing came hand in hand with the advent of modernism. And Chanel was really the apex of this in Western dress. At this time in the 1920s, she was just um, creating her little black dress, which is, you know, some people called it Chanel's Ford. Um, it became so aligned with the idea of modernism and with simplicity and function. Constructivist aesthetics were functional and they minimised gender difference as well. Class at this period was privileged over gender, and women were reconstructed as workers. So you can see there's very little domesticity in these images. And you can also see Bolshevik ideals in the textile print on the right. Again, the headscarf is tied at the back, symbolizing workers. And this is all about mechanization, about literacy, about the industrialization of the workforce. So constructivist dress was similar to socialist realist artists as well. It was about creating ideology rather than creating products. And Stepanova advocated industrial mass production of clothing over craft-produced one-offs as, as more relevant to the socialist vision. But her vision, unfortunately, would never entirely be realised in the Soviet Union, which is something that I'm going to come on to late, later. There was a huge shortage of materials at this time, and this impacted the clothing industry throughout the history of the Soviet Union. By the late 1920s, Stalin had consolidated his power, and in 1929, he initiated the first five-year plan. He abolished the new economic policy that had allowed a partial return to capitalism, um, and the Stalinist regime rejected the angular constructivist designs of the earlier 1920s, and there was a return to a more conventional version of femininity. With that, you got the birth of socialist fashion in the 1930s. 
which lasted right through until the 1980s. And this promoted more of a conventional aesthetic and also returned to traditional gender roles. Not quite as interesting as this cool avant-garde stuff that was going on in the 20s. The production system was highly centralised. Part, part of Stalin's industrialisation drive was um, he was trying to improve the textile and clothing industries in Russia. Um, and in 1935, the Dom Modeli opened in Moscow, which was the House of Prototypes. Now, this was created to organise and coordinate the clothing and textile industries, and also to design prototypes that would then be mass-produced for the whole country. After the Second World War, this was rolled out as a chain um, under, under a central institution. And in the socialist states of Eastern Europe after 1948, these industries were also nationalised. Private enterprise was prohibited, and the discussion really focused on how to produce clothing to meet the needs of socialism, while disassociating fashion from its connection with Western bourgeois values. So you're kind of really walking a tightrope at this, at this point when you're trying to bring the idea of fashion into a socialist system. The two things aren't really aligned. In 1946, so after the Second World War, Churchill references the Iron Curtain for the first time, and this period sees the onset of the Cold War. Contemporary ideas are influenced by the political and the military state of the world. In the same year that Churchill talks of the Iron Curtain, the first bikini is designed. Uh, now, this was named after Bikini Atoll, which is the Polynesian island location of American nuclear test explosions that year. The French designer of the bikini even said that it would make an impact of atomic proportions. The atomic age, the space age, all of these political and social influences would affect fashion in the coming decades. So that's the backdrop to the period that we arrive at now, the 1950s. Throughout the 50s, centralised socialist fashion continued, with an emphasis on good taste, on practicality and traditional femininity. They avoided the fashion cycle and also excessive ornamentation, so it was about trying to keep things simple. In 1953, Stalin died, um, and in three years' time, Khrushchev's leadership was consolidated. He denounced Stalin's purges, and a period known as the Khrushchev Thaw began, which was a period of sort of relative opening up to the West, um, and a time of, well, hopefully a time of peaceful coexistence. This was the idea. So after 1956, magazines could report on Western fashion. New stores opened, and regular state fashion and trade shows were held as part of attempts to create a socialist counterpart to Western consumer capitalism. Now, these designs that you see here wouldn't seem out of place in a Western fashion magazine of this period. However, the main difference being you could not buy either of these designs in a shop. You couldn't buy them anywhere. The system that Stalin had initiated was a system of representational dress. So designs were made, as you can see, prototypes were produced... So on the surface, there was a fashion system operating, albeit one that distanced itself from the rapid change of the West. However, due to the bureaucracy of centralisation and inadequate supply, these prototypes were never mass-produced. So affordable mass fashion just was not a viable option at this time in the Soviet Union. So you've got a real sort of smoke and mirrors situation going on. These, um, this one on the left was a drawing in a magazine. In fact, both of these appeared in fashion magazines in the way that you have fashion appearing in magazines you know, all the time in the 50s and now. Um, but you would not be able to buy these. These would not make it to any kind of store. What was produced was a unique prototype, which would be presented at domestic and international fairs and at socialist fashion congresses and also published in magazines. So you can see this prototype here on the right-hand side. Um, in fact, that was an all-union house of prototypes dress design from 1958, as shown in a fashion magazine. So it's likely that that was the only one of those outfits that was ever actually produced. The 1950s magazines started to encourage moderate expressions of femininity. And these illustrations show that fashion was being promoted, um, even if it wasn't being sold. 
um, that fitted in with the sort of hourglass shapes and the return to home ethos that was also being promoted in the West. So this, on the left-hand side, you've got festive evening dresses. But again, you can see they're relatively simple. Like, there's not that much embellishment going on on these dresses. Um, and on the right here, women were encouraged um, to look smart at all times, even in the home. Um, so you've got a lovely selection here of house coats and aprons that are especially nice. Um, and also, because, with, because of this return to traditional femininity, women were discouraged from wearing trousers anywhere other than the home at this period. So the trousers here are okay because they were to be worn in the home, but wearing them outside of the home wasn't such a, um, was kind of frowned upon. Now at this time, the growing middle class became more interested in fashion, and the regime actually implicitly encouraged this. So limited consumption practices began, began to be furtively encouraged with the idea that the new middle class wouldn't question the status quo of the political system if they were allowed to buy bits and pieces for themselves and their houses. So I find that a really interesting idea. It's essentially saying, you know, using consumption as a kind of opium of the masses, um, which is anti-Marxist in so many ways that I find it quite fascinating that that kind of duality was able to exist. So a number of events and exhibitions showcase Soviet design um, there were international lifestyle exhibitions and there were socialist fashion congresses throughout the Soviet bloc. And these fashion congresses were staged between socialist countries and that was the place where trends would be set in the same way that Paris set the trends in the West. Western fashion was also cautiously reintroduced to magazines at this time and by the end of the 50s, journalists were actually sent to the West to report on the fashions there. Um, there was one Yugoslav magazine in particular that hailed Chanel as an ideal designer because she was, and I quote, a promoter of functional and comfortable fashion that emphasises female beauty and is totally feminine in opposition to her competitors Dior, Givenchy or Balmain who insist on bizarre and spectacular effects. So there are Soviet fashion shows that were also staged in the West as well, even though in the shops within Russia you could not buy the clothes at all, you couldn't buy the designs that were shown. So it's again sort of the promotion of an ideal Soviet life was happening in these shows, but it didn't reflect the reality in any way. However, members of the ruling elite were secretly able to get their hands on luxury goods. Uh, one member who defected to the West talked about secret floors in department stores that were invite-only, and they sold imported goods um, at low prices, which was completely unknown to regular Soviet customers. With corruption rife in the ruling class, you can see why there was a need for a respectable middle class who were able to uphold social codes. So re-engaging with a moderate amount of consumerism was the regime's way of balancing this. So as a way of controlling the middle class, magazines began to publish dress and etiquette guides. There was a concerted effort to develop middle class cultural values. So books were published with names like On the Culture of Dress that offered advice um, about appropriate dress for different social occasions. So here you can see um, that magazines published information on you know, what kind of outfit should be worn to different social events. And at the same time, the West was publishing sort of etiquette books that again encouraged domesticity for women in the drive to get women back in the home after the Second World War. In fashion magazines in Russia, hats were promoted as a shortcut to ladylike traditional femininity, along with matching shoes and handbags, all of those kind of signifiers of 1950s fashion that we're quite familiar with, and also advice on the best colours to wear. One advice book that was called To You Girls situated fashion in the context of Russian literature. Uh, so it told girls to aspire to look like Natasha Rostova in War and Peace or Anna Karenina, which is a really lovely idea, but it's also very strange to take role models from fictional imperial aristocracy, um, but a very nice idea nonetheless. So even into the 1960s, when Western clothing began to challenge gender roles, socialist women were still being educated to become proper ladies through cultural forms like magazines and advice books. In the late 1950s, the Soviet Union was winning the space race and Khrushchev was keen to extend the competition between East and West to everyday culture and lifestyles. 
He promoted the look of socialist good taste, which was basically modest prettiness, simplicity and conventional elegance. In 1959, America and Russia showcased national, national exhibitions in each respective country, uh, which culminated with the kitchen debate between Nixon and Khrushchev, where each of them essentially argued that their way of life was better and their citizens were happier, etc., etc. I think there's some information about that um, in the exhibition here. So fashion also became a topic of ideological discussion through these exchanges. America was all about freedom and material abundance, whereas the more moralistic socialist dress attacked the sartorial codes of the West. So as the technology race waged, so did the consumer goods race. At the exhibition of Soviet culture and achievement in New York, um, there was a show of Russian fashions which proved to be incredibly popular. In fact, it was so popular um, that a report in the New York Times said that it was clear proof that an, that an atom smasher is a poor match for an attractive young lady in a well-fitted blouse. Also in 1959, Christian Dior presented his collection in Moscow. Now, this was the first couture collection shown by a Western designer in the Soviet Union, and he'd been invited, he'd been specifically invited, uh, following the French-Soviet policy of cooperation as part of Khrushchev's initiative to learn from the West. The show was really heavily publicised. Um, Dior reps and 12 models stayed in Moscow for an entire week, and they had two to three shows a day um, that featured 120 outfits. The shows themselves, I mean, you can see how huge they are, the shows were scented with Dior perfume, and even though the hall had 800 seats, they still couldn't see all the women who wanted to go to see the shows. So you can see that there was this huge desire to engage with Western fashion at this time. So this is the Russian Trade and Industrial Exhibition that happened at Earl's Court in London in 1968. And it really shows how fashion and technology were both used in these international exhibitions, often side by side. Enter the 1960s. Sputnik had been launched in 1957 and Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space in 1961. The Soviets were winning the space race and the height of the Cold War was beginning. The Berlin Wall was built in 1961 and the arms in the space race was really heating up, leading to a culture of spying and paranoia. Also in 1961, JFK made a speech to Congress in which he said his mission was to get a man to walk on the moon. With this, the spacesuit and futurist ideas of design became a big influence on fashion. In the Soviet Union, the central fashion institutions started to show mini skirts and shorts around 1966, alongside space-inspired trends as well. And you can see from this slide the clear influence of designs from the West on designs of the East. This is Pierre Cardin in 1966, and just a few years later, the Institute of Home and Clothing Culture in Prague was producing idea, uh, designs with exactly the same motif. I think it was even using the same materials. I think it was vinyl. Um, in each case as well. So in 1964 to 65, Pierre Cardin, Paco Rabanne and André Correge were at the height of their fame in Paris, showing space-age collections with synthetic materials that had never been used in fashion design before. Uh, and as a related aside, the new man-made fabrics that were produced in the 50s and 60s were often byproducts of chemical research that was undertaken for military or aeronautical purposes. Uh, for example, uh, Dewpoint, who manufactured nylon in America from the 1930s, um, also conducted research into plutonium for the Manhattan Project that developed the first nuclear weapons. I didn't know that until I was researching for this talk. I was slightly blown away by it. So technology, the military and fashion really weren't as far apart as, you might, as might be thought in this period. In 1967, there was an international fashion festival in Moscow that hosted shows by top Paris houses like Chanel and Dior. They presented West and East Europe fashions together, and it was another stage for the cultural and consumer war that was ongoing. By the end of the 60s, the central fashion institutions in the Soviet bloc began to adopt the latest Western fashions and to update their styles but they were only displayed at socialist fashion congresses or, in these illustrations from fashion mags, 
Again, they weren't mass-produced, and you could not buy these designs in the shops. And ethnic motifs such as embroidery continued to be used for ideological purposes. Um, folk embroidery, folk motifs were a feature on and off throughout this period. Now, I especially love this slide. Um, I love the way it's kind of combining old and new. It's got the Western modernism mixed with traditional Russian motifs. The dresses are really reminiscent of Yves Saint Laurent's dresses that he created that were inspired by the artwork um, of Mondrian, his abstract art. And yet it's combined with these folkloric details that you get as the border at the hems um, or on the front of that dress and the headscarf as well. Um, it's like a sort of... It's just such a conflation of East and West at this time. So ethnic motifs didn't disappear from Soviet fashion once they were introduced to counteract Western trends. Um, they were evident in fashions all over Eastern Europe's um, socialist countries. So again, ideology was at play here. Folk dress was seen as unchanging, as anti-fashion. And so it was perfect for socialist styles to, to use those motifs to counteract the fast pace and rapid change of the Western fashion system. However, as the 60s drew on, the West also became reinterested in these folk elements and ethnic details. However, the West would take and mix motifs from all over the place, much as it had done in the 1920s. So you had elements from India, from Nepal, from Eastern Europe, from all over the place, whereas socialist countries kept their idea um, of their own history to the motifs. So you get socialist fashion being mediated through national traditions. The Western, the, the Western interest is illustrated in the Polish cooperative Moda Damska, who were around at this time. They initially started um, to produce ethnic costumes for folk dancing groups. However, from the mid-1970s, they began to export their products to the West for extra revenue. There was such an interest in the West at this time in um, these sort of motifs of uh, Eastern European dress. This slide here, this is the designer Slava Zaitsev, um, who became known even in the West for his folkloric designs. In the 1960s, he caught the attention of Paris Match and Women's Wear Daily, and he began to be reported in the Western press. He was even dubbed the Red Dior. <laughs> However, this actually really angered his director. His director told him that there wasn't just one Dior at the centralized design house. There were 60, and he wasn't allowed to travel to the West for 20 years following that exchange. Uh, Zaitsev used Russian ethnic motifs, as you can see very clearly in this picture. It became a real trademark of his style. But yet again, this was a facade. His clothes weren't produced. Um, however, he did go on to have success in the West during the perestroika period in the 1980s. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, changes in fashion styles were encouraged. But again, the centralised systems found it difficult to adapt and to mass-produce designs. As connections with the West improved over those decades, the ruling powers began to lose control of socialist middle-class um, fashion choices. The Socialist Fashion Congresses continued right through until 1990, um, but they became more and more like entertainment and featured popular singers and things like that. There also continued to be fashion designers for industry, but their prototypes were still never mass-produced. Um, from the original version, even right through in the 1980s. So with so little choice to Russian consumers, despite the output of magazines and the prototype system, how did people dress themselves? Well, Soviet Union officially recognised only two types of dress production, the mass manufacturing by large state companies, which was incredibly ineffectual, and the production of custom-made dresses controlled by state-owned fashion ateliers. And these ateliers appeared in the mid-30s, and they grew from the mid-50s. Um, and they often custom-made clothes to compensate for the poor quality and the poor offer of mass-produced clothing. Uh, there were hundreds of specialised ateliers in Moscow that only offered specific items. So you could go to ones that featured, that specialised in blouses, or ones that specialised in hats, um, etc., etc. Now, all the ateliers were officially the same, but in reality there were differences between those that served elite customers 
and those that served the average customer. So clearly this wasn't a complete answer to the fashion shortage that was happening at this time. There were, however, alternative ways of accessing fashionable clothes. Home dressmaking, the black market, private salons and private seamstresses. From the 1960s, these unofficial channels, these unofficial channels became more important with the rising middle class. And they often had the discreet approval of the regimes who were kind of keen to keep people happy. These second economies offered superior goods and services than the state did, despite the fact that everyday fashion really undermined the system, the socialist system as a whole, by introducing change, by encouraging individual expression, and by breaking socialist isolation. So ideologically, fashion didn't make sense, but practically it couldn't be ignored. So home dressmaking. There's actually a sewing machine on display here, I think, isn't there, somewhere, which shows the importance of uh, home dressmaking at this period. Um, paper patterns were regular supplements to socialist fashion magazines from the 1920s onwards. Um, they usually conformed to sort of conservative socialist good taste, conservative with a small c, socialist good taste, but occasionally they published patterns of the latest Western fashion designs, but very rarely. DIY columns sprung up in magazines, uh, and the choice of fabrics for home dressmaking was actually more varied than that of mass-produced clothes because the system of mass production was so flawed. You can actually see from this side here on the left your new dress, um, which has got a great selection of fabrics that you can choose to make your own clothing with. Paper patterns were also the like they were ideal for the system because they provided a template for fashionable dress without the requirement for the state to actually make them. So patterns for evening dresses were even provided despite calling for skills and sometimes couture techniques that even professional dressmakers may not have had. So the extent to which the state relied on the skills of the populace is also shown in a column called A Little Alphabet of Cutting that started in a 1964 Yugoslav magazine. This had advice on making hats, on making fur collars, on really on making everything, even down to treating the animal skin. This was the extent to which people were supposed to be involved in the production of their own clothing. Uh, and on the right here, I love this image um, because it's so reminiscent of the Chanel suit that really became her hallmark after she, re she relaunched her fashion house in 1954. Uh, Chanel was approved in social socialist ideology because of her insistence on functionality and style. Um, when she relaunched in 1954, she created her classic suit, the Chanel suit. We all know that to this day. And this chimed with the idea of socialist simplicity, of practicality and femininity. And here you've got your own, like, knit your own versions, which is fantastic. So even though paper patterns were produced in Russia, um, there was a lot of credence in getting patterns from abroad. The German magazine Berder had cult status from the late 1960s as the patterns were very precise, uh, but it was only available on the black market until 1978 when Russian magazines began to legally reproduce them. Um, so many women also used seamstresses, although you had to be careful when you were visiting um, your own seamstresses because being self-employed didn't officially exist within the law. So you're kind of on dangerous legal territory. Moscow also had a chain of second-hand shops um, which offered Western fashion items that were supplied either by foreigners or by diplomats who would buy Western goods abroad and then sell them back at home for a profit. Uh, but the supply was really erratic, so many people turned to the black market. The black market was big business. It was expensive. Items could be three times the original price that would have been paid for them back in uh, Western Europe. Black marketeers dressed in Western clothes and they were a regular feature in front of Moscow hotels that were visited by foreigners. And the black market also developed for obvious reasons in port cities and other tourist destinations. Now the fact that this was linked to crime really helped with the ideology that fashion and consumption were decadent practices that had no place in a socialist system. Um, a magazine called Soviet Culture actually said, 22% of thefts, robberies and muggings are committed by teenagers because of fashionable goods with branded Western labels. Somehow reminiscent of the riots a few years ago, really, in the way that's being reported. 
And due to this interest in branded goods, fakes were also thriving on the black market as well. People didn't necessarily care if the product, if the product had provenance. It just had to have a sort of brand. Now, it's interesting that jeans were one of the most popular items available on the black market. Ideologically, they were emblematic of American youth culture, so they had representative value as well as material value. It wasn't until 1975 that the Soviet Union began to produce their own jeans for the first time. They were initially of really poor quality, um, and it was just one of many attempts to manufacture denim. And this really highlights not only the huge problems of mass manufacture um, that occurred in the Soviet centralised system, but also the importance of fashion in creating not only aesthetic, but also highly symbolic cultural products. And I just wanted to finish off with some further reading. These are the books that I got most of my research from. They're really fantastic books. Uh, Fear and Fashion in the Cold War and Fashion East, The Spectre That Haunted Socialism. Um, what's interesting is that in Bartlett's book here, she says, for most, wearing the latest fashions was not an act of subversion, but an act of communication with their fellow class members. Um, and so I love that idea that fashion, it wasn't an anti-socialist stance, but it was just a sort of show of solidarity with your peers. Um, thank you. is to do with the history. I think as well as you have developing markets all over the world, um, markets go through processes of maturation. You, you find that in all the BRIC countries at the moment, Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, and different levels of sophistication, I suppose, is the way it's termed. So you do tend to, these sort of emerging economies traditionally tend to go through a phase of enjoying very conspicuous consumption before it, there's then a sort of readjustment, which, I mean, there has been in Russia, there has been in China, there has been in all of those countries now. Um, but I think that process kind of necessarily has to be gone through before you can kind of come out the other side, I think. Um, how are you I think getting fabrics was a lot easier than getting pieces that were actually manufactured. The, um, the range of fabrics was much better buying for home dressmaking than it was, for, than it was in the actually man, actual manufactured clothes. Um, and I think that it was, home dressmaking was really encouraged because it sort of took the pressure off the fact that this vast manufacturing system wasn't working. Um, it's interesting that in, well, it's like in the 90s, if any of you have been to the Malevich exhibition at the Tate um, Modern at the moment, they talk a lot in there about his work in the 1920s and how there was a real shortage of paper. They had to reuse paper because it wasn't being manufactured in Russia. It was, could, was only being imported. Um, and it kind of really had resonance when I was doing the research for this as well, that idea that you have to, you can only really bring products in from the outside. But I think the actual manufacture of fabric was a lot better um, and a lot more cohesive than the manufacture of clothing. So that wasn't such a problem, I don't think. Um, hey, actually, a little snippet of real life um, examples for it, but I also have a question. Uh, my dad in the late 60s in the Soviet Union um, was probably told dot. I'm not exactly sure by whom, but I suppose it might have been while he was studying at the university for wearing very short shorts, because <laughs> it was seen to be basically like a proper capitalist kind of Beatles-inspired kind of piece of clothing. And I think what they used to do is to kind of properly kind of, how to put this, um, sort of put shame on someone, and it used to be these big kind of, you know, boards of kind of, um, sort of shameful students, you know, just picture of stuff that don't wear very short shorts. <laughs> 
Surely that's just promoting it. But I also have a question, sort of, um, I don't know, you might have done research into this. In terms of body shapes and models, right, um, whether, um, is there anything that, from what you've read about Soviet models and what, whether they were similar or different sizes, um, height, I don't know, any I don't know about height, but in terms of sizes, all of the fashion photographs and illustrations that I've seen conform very much to Western ideals at the time. So all of the 50s designs are, you know, crazy hourglass shape, slim but very hourglass. Um, and then in the 60s, it becomes a bit more boyish, a bit straighter, but still slim. Um, yeah, I couldn't see any difference in body shape, actually. But that's, that's an interesting area. It would be good to look into that further, definitely. Yep. Um, you said about um, mainstream encouraging people to dress as characters in literature. What, whose decision was it of what those characters looked like that they had to conform to it? Was that something that there was a Soviet idea of this is what they wanted this character to look like? Or was there... From films, from serials of books? Um, I don't know. That was, that was just one article that was recommending that. I don't think it was like a sort of general practice or a general expectation. Um, I just I found that in, like, in one article that I was reading about. And I thought it was interesting because it's slightly bizarre to me for a socialist system to be encouraging you to dress like a, an imperial princess. <laughs> I can't quite align that. But I don't think it was a general yeah. kind of... I don't think it was generally promoted as an idea. Um, but it's a nice idea. Um, so I would imagine... Um, I mean, he's quite descriptive, Tolstoy. So I would imagine it would to be taken from literature sure. rather than film. If I may add, I, I wonder whether the reason for one of the reasons for that, made up in the general classical literature, was and is still in Russia the literature, right? Yeah, it was all, and especially from what I vaguely remember, starting from the 1950s, 60s, literature in the 19th century um, was very much promoted. And I wonder whether it was kind of part of the same mm -hmm. route to show that this is the idea, this is the route, you know, this is what proper Russian. Hmm. Um, Way of existing. Yeah, possibly, very possibly. There was also in the mid fifties, Audrey Hepburn was in a production of in a film of War and Peace, wasn't she? I don't know if that infiltrated or if that obviously she was a big fashion icon in the West. I don't know if that would have fed into it at all. <laughs> yeah. No, I, <laughs> I wish I'd gone to Russia to research. I have been to Russia in the past, but not for this research. It was, a lot of it was done through these books um, and through all the articles and journals and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm a lecturer at London College of Fashion, so I use the library there a lot. So I was looking through their sort of academic journals and things like that. It was all in English, yeah. It was all in English. I, um, I can't read Russian. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> um, I have a few questions related to the same theme. Um, I wonder if you know of any reaction to the Dior show um, in Moscow at the time, maybe in the press or in the general public. And the second um, thing that I found out um, while working on this exhibition, which I thought was really fascinating, was that Dior didn't come back to do a fashion show in Moscow until 2013, I think. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think there was another fashion show. Was it? I'm not sure if it was in. There was. A, I definitely read about another one of the international fashion exhibitions that had. It wasn't. Um, it was after Christian Dior himself had died. But it was Mark Bohan was the designer. He was there. I think Pierre Cardin was there, and I think it was one that had um, Slava Zaitsev showing as well. Um, so I think they did come back. Again, I think that was in the late 60s. Um, in terms of reactions to the Dior show, I don't know much about that, actually, but I know there, is, there was one, there has been a full article written about that Dior show that I can, I can give you the reference, if you like, and then you can let people know. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. I'm Yeah, I think there's actually some of that here in the exhibition, isn't there? Beauty products and things like that. I think um, it would have fitted into those, uh, the idea of socialist good taste. Mm -hmm. So enough to make you pretty, but not enough to make up to make you stand out. Not enough makeup that was, you know, not obvious makeup. Just keep it simple, mm -hmm. but feminine. Um, and I, there are some, I don't know if you want to speak about the, some of the products that you've got here on show. some perfumes as well which is quite interesting because I think the chemical industry was just being developed so obviously they now had access to um, they were able to make perfume for everyone and it wasn't deemed to be a luxury item anymore um, and they were very proud of it because um, expanding the chemical industry was also part of the seven-year plan that Hushchev um, was developing um, so I think what um, I found interesting was um, to see how the perfumes were being promoted in that the sort of you know husbands were encouraged to buy them for International Women's Day or you know so you could buy your your mother a nice perfume but it wasn't supposed to be you know um, like an all out um, shopping spree but it, the people were still kind of allowed in a way to to buy these products now it became deemed appropriate to buy them. Hmm. And there was definitely Dior perfume pumped throughout his show as well so it was something that, that the designers were really keen to yeah promote okay thank you <laughs>